from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Thank you, Lori. Uh, I, too, am proud to mention that the Washington Post has uh, been a charter sponsor of the National Book Festival for 13 years since its inception. And I want to make special mention, of course, of the Library of Congress uh, for putting on such a uh, wonderful event. Uh, now to our, uh, our author and our speaker, uh, Rick, At Rick, Rick Atkinson. Uh, Rick uh, served as a reporter, foreign correspondent, and senior editor of the Washington Post for 25 years. Uh, it's my personal misfortune that I arrived too late at the Post to work with him. He is rightly regarded as one of the most distinguished journalists of our time. His talents as a writer and a reporter and his unparalleled expertise in military affairs were a gift to the Post and to our readers. Yet with his latest book, Rick reminds us again that his gifts continue, only in different form, as a historian. He dedicated nearly 15 years of his life to these three remarkable volumes. The Los Angeles Times has called the Liberation Trilogy, quote, a masterpiece of deep reporting and powerful storytelling. The New York Times Review calls the trilogy epic, and this finale a, quote, tapestry of fabulous richness and complexity. The Washington Post reviewer described the prose as achingly sublime. Now, it's 877 pages, but the reviewer noted, uh, while saying this is a very long book, he said, this one seemed too short. In a recent interview with the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, Rick remarked on the necessity of remembering and telling the story of this war, what he called the greatest self-inflicted catastrophe in human history, 60 million dead, one life snuffed out every three seconds for six years. And Rick added, of more than 16 million American veterans of World War II, fewer than two million remain alive. When we contemplate what is lost to us culturally as they slip into the shadows at the rate of 800 a day, foremost perhaps is the ability to bear witness, to tell the story firsthand, to attest with authenticity and authority why they fought suffered and died. For all the stories told and retold, countless others will now go untold. So as the primary storytellers die off, it's important for their survivors, for us, to sustain the story, to keep it a vivid narrative that lives and breathes, rather than something desiccated, rapidly receding into the past with ever diminishing power to stir us. Rick Atkinson has done more than almost anyone to sustain the story to give it continued life. For that, we can all be grateful. I'm proud to introduce Rick, Rick Atkinson. Well, thank you, Marty. And I also regret that we didn't overlap. Um, Thanks so much for uh, coming this afternoon to this fantastic conclave of readers and writers. I apologize to those of you who are sitting here expecting to see my friend Evan Thomas. That was the last hour. I really apologize to those of you expecting to see my friend Khalid Hosseini. That's a different tent. I'd also like to thank the Library of Congress and the Washington Post, the other corporate sponsors for making this one of the great uh, annual events in our town. It's not this town, it's not that town, it's our town, whether you live in the District of Columbia or not. And the National Book Festival shows that you can still be civil and thoughtful and fun in Washington, D.C. So Jack London said that a writer ought not wait for inspiration to come knocking on the door, but instead should go looking for it with a club. And 15 years ago, I took my club, and what I found, what inspired me, was the Second World War. The war lasted 2,174 days, and by the end, it was the greatest catastrophe in human history. As Marty said, 60 million dead. That's 27,600 dead every day, or 1,150 dead an hour. If you were a German boy born between 1915 and 1924, 
the odds were one in three that by 1945 you would be dead. 14% of the Soviet population of 190 million perished during the war. 60 million dead in six years is a death every three seconds. One, two, three. One, two, three. That's World War II. The writer Kingsley Amos once said that he only wanted to read books that begin, a shot rang out. The way I've approached the Second World War is to look on it as a trilogy, as a, as a triptych with three panels that mutually reinforce one another. And in that tale, many, many shots ring out. I begin where the American war in Europe really begins, in Northern Africa, with the invasion by British and American troops in November 1942. And then we move in the second panel, the second panel of this triptych, my second volume, north across the Mediterranean with those British and American troops for the invasion of Sicily in July of 1943, and then to mainland Italy and to places like Salerno, the Rapido River, Anzio, the Volturno River, and on to the liberation of Rome on June 4th, 1944. Well, this third volume, this final panel, opens on May 15th, 1944, at St. Paul's School on Hammersmith Road in London. And there, on May 15th, Eisenhower, Patton, Omar Bradley, Winston Churchill, King George VI, and several dozen of the most senior commanders have gathered to review for a last time the plan called Overlord, which is the invasion of France, which is to take place in three weeks. They met in an auditorium at St. Paul's called the Model Room. And the generals and admirals were bundled up in their overcoats because even though it was the middle of May, it was cold as a meat locker. And they sat on hard wooden benches normally reserved for schoolboys. The poet John Milton, among other English luminaries, had gone to St. Paul's. On the floor of the cockpit of this auditorium was an enormous plaster of Paris relief map of the Normandy coast where the River Seine empties into the Atlantic. And a British brigadier in no skid socks shuffled around on this map as they discussed the individual locales on what would become in three weeks the most famous battlefield in the world. The beaches, for example. Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, Sword. And towns that no one had ever heard of but soon would become infamous. Towns like St. Lo and Cherbourg and Cannes. And just on the edge of the map, there's Paris. And then for the next 12 chapters, the tale unspools at these places and others. Mortain, Falaise, Paris, the Hurricane Forest, Nijmegen, Arnhem, the Battle of the Bulge, the encirclement of the Ruhr, and the final drive to VE Day, Victory in Europe Day, on May 8, 1945. And as in the first two volumes, we periodically shift from a tactical foxhole view to a higher perspective where we can see operationally and strategically what's going on. Much of chapter 10, for example, is set in Malta and Yalta, where we're in the company of Churchill, Roosevelt, Stalin, and their senior commanders. And we often peek in on the other side of the hill to see what the Germans are doing. I also recount at some length the invasion of southern France in August 1944, as well as the subsequent drove drive up the Rhone River Valley by French and American troops and the lunge through the Vosges Mountains to capture Strasbourg and to reach the Rhine in November 1944. It's four months before the armies that are coming from Normandy arrive on the Rhine. It's an important part of the liberation of Europe. It's, it's a part that many Americans know very little about. And the characters are fantastic. They include the American generals Jacob Devers and Alexander Patch, 
and the French First Army commander, a general named Jean de la de Tassigny, who is beyond the power of any novelist to invent. He was described by one of his admirers as an animal of action, and Delat would often appear in the middle of the night in bivouacs where his soldiers were sleeping, and he would roar out, waking them up, what have you done for France? He's that kind of guy. Well, as you may suspect, the liberation of Europe is not an undiscovered subject. Amazon.com lists 60,000 hardcover World War II titles. How do you tell that story so that you and you and you feel that you're hearing it again as if for the first time? Well, part of that is voice, of course, and narrative coherence. But a good part of it must be archival spade work. And when it comes to World War II, an archive rat like me can live large. The US Army records alone for the Second World War weigh 17,000 tons. Like all great events in American history, World War II is bottomless. There are wonderful things still to discover. So for example, I found at the National Archives in College Park about 15 miles from here, a document that revealed the thinking about how are you going to get onto the beaches at Normandy if you know that the Germans are prepared for you to come by sea, the beaches are going to be heavily defended. How are you going to get ashore by air, by parachute, or by glider? You know the Germans are going to be defending that too. Someone proposed, how about digging a tunnel under the English Channel? And so there was a study done, and the officers who reported back to the high command said, yes, sir, we can do this. It will take 15,000 miners a year to excavate 50,000 tons of spoil, but we can do this. What they couldn't finesse, what they could never figure out, was what happened when that first miner popped his head out of the tunnel in Normandy, and the entire German 7th Army was waiting for him. There was a whole collection of these problems, and they had their own acronym, PINWI, Problems of the Invasion of Northwest Europe. There was anxiety, for example, that German airplanes would fly over England and drop rats infested with bubonic plague. And there was a bounty offered on rat carcasses to test for plague. There was anxiety that the Germans would fly over London and drop something called radioactive agents on London and there were Geiger counters hidden all around the city to test for radioactivity. The Allies, incidentally, stockpiled 160,000 tons of chemical weapons in England and the Mediterranean in case the war turned chemical. That's about 160 times more than the Syrians are suspected to harbor at this point. I found also at the National Archives two plans for chemical warfare in Normandy. Both of them had been approved by Eisenhower. The first plan was predicated on caring about French civilian casualties. The second plan, not so much. And in fact, there would have been tens of thousands of French civilian casualties had the war become a chemical war. U.S. Army draftee standards during the Second World War were progressively lowered to allow the drafting of what were known as physically imperfect men. So, for example, when the draft began in earnest in 1942, you had to have at least 12 of your natural 32 teeth in order to be drafted. By 1944, how many teeth did you have to have to be drafted? Zero. And that's because the Army and the Navy had drafted one-third of all the dentists in America. And collectively, they extracted 15 million teeth, they filled 68 million more, and they made two and a half million sets of dentures, all to allow those draftees to be able to masticate the army ration. I know it sounds like an obscene act, but that was the standard. By 1944, a man could be drafted with 2,400 vision if it was correctable to 2040 in one eye. You could be drafted. In fact, the vision standards had eroded so badly that the old bromide that the Army didn't really examinize, it just counted them, had come true. 
And in fact, you could be drafted if you were blind in one eye, if you were deaf in one ear, if you were missing both external ears. You could be drafted if you were missing a thumb or three fingers on one hand, including your trigger finger. When the draft began in earnest, venereal disease had kept many soldiers out of the Army. But that restriction, too, was soon lifted, and the Army was soon drafting, by 1944, 12,000 VD patients a month, most of them syphilitic. How could they do that? Penicillin, that extraordinary discovery by British scientists in the 1920s, had been converted into an extraordinary industrial project by the Americans and the British, so that a substance that had been made originally by the gram was soon made by the kilogram and eventually by the ton. Well, why these extreme measures to fill the ranks? It was because of the crying need for soldiers, especially infantrymen and especially riflemen. Even in a country of 130 million, we were running out. The Brits did run out. The war remained brutal and voracious to the very end. In April 1945, the last full month of the war in Europe, almost 11,000 American soldiers were killed in action in Europe. That's nearly as many as died in June 1944, the month of invasion. It was awful virtually to the last gunshot. So desperate was the American Army for infantrymen that the High Command took an action that had been absolutely unthinkable just a few months before. They allowed black soldiers to volunteer for duty as infantrymen in white units. 53 platoons of colored infantry were integrated into 11 otherwise all-white divisions. Many of those African-American soldiers surrendered sergeant stripes that they had earned as cooks and drivers and laborers for the privilege of being riflemen. There are many other surprises and discoveries in this saga. I found at the Franklin Roosevelt Library in Hyde Park, New York, for example, a detailed account written by the Atlanta Funeral Home Director who had prepared Franklin Roosevelt's body for burial when the president died at Warm Springs, Georgia, on April 12, 1945. The document is as powerful and as moving as it is clinical. After several hours spent injecting six bottles of embalming fluid into the president's veins and ar arteries, this mortician summoned Arthur Prettyman, who was the president's valet, and he handed him a comb and he had him comb the president's hair just so. John Updike once said that World War II was the 20th century's central myth. He called it a, a tale of Troy whose angles are infinite and whose central figures never fail to amaze us with their size, their theatricality, their sweep. Well, theatrical they are. And I believe the narrative historian's true calling is to bring back the dead. I try to do that not only with the outsized figures you're familiar with, the Eisenhowers and Pattons of the war, but also others who are less familiar, like Generals Ted Roosevelt, Jr. and Lucian Truscott, Jr. Even amid the clash of army groups, my eye is always drawn to the particular small tragedy that illuminates the larger catastrophe. So for example, I tell the story of the death of the son of General Alexander Patch. He's a young captain named Mac Patch. I tell it through the letters that General Patch and his wife exchange to each other, and they're unspeakably heartbreaking. Young Captain Patch has been wounded in Normandy. He's recuperating under his father's command in southern France. His mother writes to General Patch, begging her husband not to let him go back into combat too soon. He goes back into combat in October 1944, and he's killed almost immediately. General Patch writes to his wife, and he says, I cannot and must not allow myself to dwell upon our irreparable loss. 
As I write, the tears are falling from my eyes. Providence decrees, and we must obey. Providence decrees, and we must obey. How many families in the Second World War had similar sentiments? I tell the t story of the suicide of Rear Admiral Don P. Moon, who had commanded the naval forces landing at Utah Beach on June 6, 1944, and shortly before the invasion of southern France, where he was also to have a large responsibility. He blew his brains out in the cabin of his flagship in Naples Harbor. The stress had unhinged him, and the suicide note that he left for his wife and four children is really devastating. He, part of it read, what am I doing to you, my wife and dear children? I'm sick, so sick. I mentioned that the United States had a population during World War II of about 130 million. And we put 16,115,566 into uniform during the war. Of those, there were about a million and a half veterans still alive, my father among them. They're leaving us at the rate of more than 40,000 a month. It's almost 1,500 a day now. The number of surviving American veterans from World War II will slip below one million just about this time next year. And in 2024, the number of survivors will drop below 100,000. And in 2036, which is the last year for which government demographers have made calculations, the number of survivors of the most destructive war in human history in the United States will drop below 400 less than half the size of an infantry battalion. This country suffered less than any of the other major belligerents. We emerged from the war with our industrial base not only intact, but thriving. We emerged from the war with two-thirds of the world's gold supply, with plentiful energy, and with a great sense of optimism and hope in the future. But about 400,000 Americans died during the war. 291,000 of them were killed in action. And of those killed in action, almost half of those occurred in Europe in that last year. In 1947, the next of kin of all Americans who had died and whose bodies had been recovered overseas, and that was nearly everyone, who had died in the Pacific of the Atlantic theaters, those next of kin were given a one-time opportunity to choose whether or not to bring their dead sons, and they were mostly sons, to bring them home or to leave them buried overseas in one of about two dozen American Battle Monuments Commission cemeteries. About 40% chose to leave their boys overseas, and about 60% brought them home. It cost the United States government $564.50 per exhumation, regardless of the ultimate disposition of the body, something only a rich, victorious nation could afford. Every grave was opened by hand, and the remains of every dead soldier dusted with an embalming compound of formaldehyde, aluminum chloride, wood powder, clay, and plaster of Paris. They were then placed in a metal casket with a satin pillow. Labor strikes in the United States had caused a shortage of casket steel. And there was also a shortage of licensed embalmers. And the dead accumulated in warehouses at Cardiff and Cherbourg and elsewhere. Finally, the SS Joseph V. Connolly, the first of 21 ghost ships from Europe and the Pacific sailed from Antwerp with more than 5,000 soldiers in her hold. On October 27, 1947, the Connolly birthed in New York, and stevedores winched the caskets from her hold in specially designed slings, two by two, and these dead and those that followed began a great diaspora across the Republic for burial in their hometown cemeteries and in national cemeteries. That's how the dead came home. <laughs>
But what about their belongings? What about the things they carried? Well, even before the dead came home, these things had been coming home. At a large warehouse on Hardesty Avenue in Kansas City, the U.S. Army Effects Bureau had begun as a modest quartermaster enterprise with only a half dozen employees in February 1942. And that expanded to more than a dozen workers. And by August 1945, they were handling 60,000 shipments a month, each laden with the effects of American dead from six continents. Hour after hour, day after day, shipping containers were unloaded from the rail freight cars that pulled up to the siding next to that warehouse on Hardesty Avenue. They were pulled onto a receiving dock, and then they were hoisted by elevator to the depot's 10th floor. And here, inspectors pawed through the crates to extract pornography, ammunition, perhaps amorous letters from a girlfriend you didn't want a grieving widow to see. Workers used grinding stones and dentist drills to remove corrosion and blood stains from web gear and other equipment. Laundresses took pains to scrub blood stains out of the uniforms. And the containers worked their way by assembly line down, seven, down to the seventh floor. And finally, a detailed inventory of the effects was pinned to a repack container, and it was stacked in a storage bin. And all the while, in a large adjacent room, banks of typists were banging out letters, 70,000 letters a month by the summer of 1945. And the gist of those letters was this, dear sir, dear madam, we have your dead son stuff. Where shall we send it? Over the years, the Effects Bureau found many things, tapestries, enemy swords, a German machine gun, an Italian accordion, a tobacco sack full of diamonds, shrunken head, among thousands of diaries also collected in Kansas City was a small notebook that had belonged to Lieutenant Herschel G. Horton, 29, from Aurora, Illinois. Shot in the right leg and hip in a firefight with the Japanese on New Guinea, Horton had dragged himself out of the fire zone and into a grass shaddy. And in the several days that it took for him to die, he wrote a final letter home to his family. And it began, my dear, sweet father, mother, and sister. I lay here in this terrible place, wondering not why God has forsaken me, but why he is making me suffer. The first duty is to remember. I can think of no better way to close out the National Book Festival than to quote from our current poet laureate, Natasha Trethway. She ends her poem, Pilgrimage, which is about a visit to Vicksburg, with these lines. In my dream, the ghost of history lies down beside me, rolls over, pins me beneath a heavy arm. My ambition with this trilogy has been for you, too, to feel that heavy arm to feel the palpable presence of those who suffered much and in some cases gave everything for us. Thank you so much for being here. I look for your questions and your comments. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Yes, uh, I'm particularly interested in the uh, account you write about the Battle of the Bulge, where it seems that American command, you know, American commanders like Courtney Hodges 
seem to really fall down in, their, in the performance of their job, where even Omar Bradley is kind of denying that the line has broken and there's German troops pouring through, the 5th Panzer's arms, the army is coming through. And I'm always fascinated as to why, you know, these commanders remained in place, particularly Courtney Hodges, who probably wasn't suited for the command, you know, in the first place of the first army, and considering the ramifications of what occurred subsequently. How did he survive, and uh, did we learn anything from those kinds of situations where it seems like everything devolved upon, like, the, the chief of staff and not the actual commander, and, yeah. Yeah. and then they brought in Field Marshal Montgomery, that whole thing, you know. Okay, we're going to make them read the book to find yeah. out what else happens. <laughs> so, uh, and briefly, yeah. because the Battle of the Bulge is the largest battle fought in American military history, um, and it would take us a long time to go through it in detail, but in answer to your question, it began on December 16th, 1944. It took the Americans, it fell almost entirely on the Americans, uh, a raid in the Belgian Ardennes, and in the Ardennes that extend down into Luxembourg, it took them almost entirely by surprise. It was an enormous intelligence failure. It was an intelligence failure ranking right up there with Pearl Harbor and 9-11. Because uh, there was great surprise, and because the uh, uh, Germans had attacked at a part of the Ardennes where we were particularly lightly uh, uh, defended, um, there was great confusion. And in fact, Courtney Hodges, Lieutenant General, who was the commander of the U.S. First Army, um, had what appears to be a nervous breakdown of sorts at a very inopportune moment. He closed the door of his office in Spa uh, and put his head down on the desk and basically for 24 hours his chief of staff ran First Army at a time when it appeared as though the Germans might overrun First Army. Hmm. There was concern that uh, Hodges was obviously not up to it. Uh, Field Marshal Montgomery, although this was out of his sector, was given the responsibility of taking over Hodges' First Army and a big portion of the American forces. And Montgomery went and looked Hodges directly in the eye and came to the conclusion that, in fact, he had righted the ship somehow, mm -hmm. that whatever affliction had caused him to uh, put his head down on the desk seemed to have passed. He wrote to Eisenhower, who was the supreme commander in Europe, and said, he's not the man that I would have chosen, but I think we're going to be OK, and I'll keep a close eye on him. Yeah. Hodges actually recovered sufficiently to finish the war out. There were a number of instances where commanders, not just at the Battle of the Bulge, yeah. just simply didn't measure up, and they were relieved. First Army, in particular, ironically, was very precipitous in relieving uh, commanders and replacing them. In Hodges' case, he got a second chance. Thank you. Sir. First of all, thank you for your trilogy and your very powerful, thoughtful presentation today. Thank you, sir. Yeah. My question is, in some ways, related to this last question. I want to get your take on Eisenhower as commander-in-chief. We know that he had no battlefield experience. In your first book, you mention how lousy our generalship was in the African campaign <coughs> to the extent that Eisenhower himself was surprised he wasn't relieved. Then in your last book, you mention again Eisenhower stationed himself in positions way behind the front unaware of what was going on on a day-by-day -day basis. Yeah. You also mention that uh, Eisenhower was not aware of Montgomery's failure in the opening or the attempt to open the port of Antwerp, which was so important. So and you want I, me to talk about Eisenhower? I want you to talk okay. about Eisenhower's commander. All right. All right. Well, Eisenhower is somebody I've lived with every day very intimately for 15 years, and my estimation of him has only grown. I think uh, you, some of you may have heard Evan talk about him as president. Um, he grows into that presidency basically by virtue of what he goes through in the Second World War. It's true. He shows up at Gibraltar commanding his, his uh, first command, having never heard a shot fired in anger. He never commanded even a platoon in the First World War. And now he's a theater commander. He's got 
the entire Allied force in the Mediterranean. <coughs> Eisenhower has a number of things going for him. He's learning as he goes, as do most of uh, these American commanders. He's got a very big brain. We underestimate how smart he is. He's extremely articulate. Churchill, who knows something about words, at one point says to the chief of the Imperial General Staff, General Brooke, I'm not sure I trust a general who's this glib. So he can speak and write very precisely. There's rarely any ambiguity about what it is that Eisenhower wants you to do if you're a subordinate of his. He's got a basic humanity to him that uh, appeals not only to his immediate subordinates, but all through the ranks. The average private, although he may not know Eisenhower uh, from Patton, from Bradley, might not know him to see him, has the sense that Eisenhower cares about him personally. And there's something to that. Eisenhower is able to convey that, A, he knows the way home, and that's what soldiers really care about, and B, that he will do his best to be sure that you do not risk your life in a vain cause. And that's something soldiers also care about. So Eisenhower has this uh, great ability, I think, to project competence, he is competent, and to project a sense that he is actually in command of this enormous, sprawling, multinational thing called the uh, Allied Coalition. He's an extraordinary guy. I, I think very, very highly of him. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you so much for your trilogy. It's, it's really superb. I've thank read you. all of them. Really outstanding. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing a lot of World War II uh, oral history interviews. I've established a nonprofit World War II history archive to encourage people to, to do an interview with a vet and send it to Vets History Project. Or, and uh, I was just wondering, do, do you, uh, have you ever consulted you know, any of the oral history available for any of your work? And uh, you know, if not, uh, what, you know, what are some of the thoughts you might have had in utilizing that? Um, I use oral histories a lot, but I use almost no contemporary <laughs> oral histories. And I do almost none myself. And the reason for this is, my father is 89 years old, enlisted in the Army in 1943. He's completely compass mentis. But I would not rely on what he told me happened 70 years ago uh, any more than I would uh, rely on what somebody told me they thought had happened a century ago. Uh, the contemporaneous record, including oral histories, is so extraordinary. The Army sent some very good historians including people like um, uh, Martin Blumenson, uh, who uh, you know, became one of the finest World War II historians after the war, and he was a sergeant in World War II, out to interview soldiers virtually as they're coming off of the battlefield. Sometimes it was within hours. Frequently it was within days or weeks. And these extraordinary transcripts of those oral histories are in the National Archives. There's hundreds and hundreds of them from all major actions, uh, particularly late in the war. So there's that. And then there are many, many other contemporaneous archival records of one sort or another that uh, allow you not to rely on 70-year-old memories. As much as I admire what you and others do now, sure. trying to get, sometimes you try to tease out that, that little anecdote that you would never get anywhere else than by some guy telling you in 2013, even though it may have happened in 1943. But I rather go back to 1943 myself. Thanks yeah, for that. Th sure. Sir. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I read extensively about World Wars I and II, and thank you for greatly enriching my library. Uh, it, it, it always astonishes me our capacity to do harm to ourselves, and my wife always wonders why I immerse myself in this ongoing horror story. So my question is, you spend a lot of time reading about what we do to each other in a horrific way, and I'm curious how that affects you, how that changes your view of humanity. Um. That's a tough question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been living with uh, the greatest catastrophe in human history for 15 years. Uh, I live with young men dying young every day. Um, I know it affects me. Uh, it breaks my heart. Every day, it breaks my heart. I try to use it as a propulsion system. 
I try to um, use uh, this calamity, both individually and globally, as a, a, a means of harnessing my energies and talents as a writer in order to convey 70 years later what it was like, what it cost, what it meant. Um, uh, you know, like Courtney Hodges, every once in a while, I suppose I want to close the door and put my head down on the desk, uh, but we, we soldier on, don't we? Um, so I, I, I do believe that there's actually an impact uh, on me, uh, viscerally uh, and emotionally. Um, but um, I, I try to use it effectively to my own purposes. We've got time for two more questions, I'm told. Sir. Yes, hi. Um, I'm currently in the midst of another war trilogy, uh, Shelby Foote's uh, Civil War, a narrative. If I were to take on your trilogy, um, what would I find uh, that was similar, and what would I find that was different? Thank well, you. Well, thank you. Uh, well, in mine, you'd find footnotes. <laughs> Look, I love Shelby Foote. I go back and reread Shelby Foote a lot because I very consciously try to emulate some of what Shelby Foote does. But there's 3,000 pages on the Civil War, and there's not a single footnote. You cannot get away with that today. Now, uh, I'm not impugning his scholarship at all. He's, he did the work. Um, what I find in him that speaks to me personally and that affects uh, the way that I wrote this trilogy is I think something we were talking about just a minute ago. He, he fought, you're looking for the emotional center of this. You're looking for resonances that speak to us through the decades. You're looking to find the same thing that speaks to us about war that we find in Thucydides. And Shelby Foote is, I think, extraordinary at being able to find, not only to tell a good story and to to uh, take a very complex yarn and make it coherent, but in ways that really resonate. You, you read that book with your eyes and with your brain, but you feel that those three books in, in your heart. And so I think that's probably something that I, I try to emulate from him, plus footnotes. Yes, ma'am, you get the last yeah, word. Thank you. Following up on footnotes, could you just address what is the process that you that you follow to undertake something of this scope? I mean, do you just d dry, dive into the 17 tons at the archives? Or you know, how do you keep track of what you're finding in the archives? And then how do you commit it on paper? Yeah, this, this crowd really wants to hear about my process, I'm sure. 17,000 tons. Um, well, I'll be very succinct. Um, I don't just dive in. Uh, that would be a prescription for uh, getting wandering into the woods and never wandering out. Um, I, my process is to uh, set a date certain when I will stop researching. And I can fix that date because the contract tells me when the manuscript is due. And I can count backwards, and I know roughly how long it will take me to write. And I know roughly how long it will take me to outline the research that I've gotten, and that leaves me with X amount of months to do the research. And then I try to be smart about where I'm doing the research. So in my case, uh, I spend a lot of time at the National Archives, the Library of Congress, the Army's Military History Institute in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, which is a fabulous uh, archive, uh, at, at Kew, where the British National Archive is, and probably a couple of dozen other places. Um, and then you've got to deal with the secondary material. And I mentioned those 60,000 books. You feel obliged to at least wave a hand over a good portion of them, and in many cases to really get down into them because there's some fabulous works there. Um, I put it all in, every uh, piece of information that I come up with goes into a Word file. The Word files are kept in, uh, in my own filing system. I deal with no documents when it comes time to write. And then I make an extraordinarily detailed outline. I use the uh, outlining software on Word, which I think is the greatest invention since the plow. Uh, and I build an outline, and the outline for this third and final volume is about 700,000 words long. 
it's more than twice as long as the book itself. But it acts not only as a roadmap to tell me where I'm going when I sit down to write, but it also tells me where all the information is. It tells me where in different files it is. And so then, okay, I'm ready to write. I sit down, having been an old newspaper man, I can type really fast. I write about a thousand words a day. Um, and for us old newspaper men, that's about equivalent to uh, a typical day story that any reporter can knock out. So a 270,000 word book, as this third and final volume is, I tell myself it's only 270 day stories. That's less than a year of writing. Uh, so with the, that's how I do it. I spend the afternoons, I write until it start, starts to turn to mush around noon. Uh, I spend the afternoon editing and, and uh, reading back through what I have read in the, uh, written in the morning and preparing for the next day's writing, which consists of taking that segment of the outline and further refining it. And then I read it one last time uh, after dinner, and that's it. I put it away. And I usually don't mess with it again until uh, we're in the final editing of the book. And the next thing you know, you got a book. That's it. We're out of time. Thank you so much. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.